he reaches out his hand of grace to lift us up from whatever may be paralyzing our lives so that we can walk and jump and dance in newness of life before him. Oh, Father God, our hearts are filled to overflowing with gratitude to you. As Keith and Arlene have led us to the foot of your cross. As Anthony has reminded us of your saving blood. And so we have come before you today with the offering of our lives. And through the gifts that you have blessed us with, we have blessed one another. Thank you for the beautiful music, for the heartfelt reading of your word, for the meaningful prayers. But now we sit in anticipation of your message to us, even through these humble lips of clay. Speak to us, we pray that your name may be glorified and that your people may be edified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My sermon today is entitled, Father God. It's a reflection of the salutation that I have heard many of you use as you've addressed God in prayer. To be clear, today is not Father's Day Sabbath. That was last week. But as you know, we were unable to celebrate it last Sabbath because we were at camp meeting. And so even though it's past, we can't allow Father's Day Sabbath to go without first acknowledging the incredible fathers that we have in our congregation. Fathers who sacrifice their lives for their families on a daily basis. And so thank you, thank you fathers for the spiritual patriarchs that you are. Thank you for being providers for your families, protectors of your wife and children. Thank you for your presence in their lives and in the life of this church. This church is what it is today in large part because of you. And so we thank you for your sacrifice. Many years ago, when my father-in-law was a surgical resident at a Jewish hospital in New York, he overheard the son of one of his colleagues calling his dad by his first name. Now, I understand that in some cultures, that's perfectly acceptable but not in Asian culture. And after my father finished, or father-in-law finished picking his jaw up off the ground, he vowed that his children would never disrespect him in that way. He determined that they would learn how to respect their elders according to the Asian values that he held near and dear to his heart. And so he made an incredible sacrifice, giving up a, potential, a potentially lucrative career as a surgeon here in the United States of America. He took his entire family back to the Philippines. Philippines. 
to raise them in an environment and in a culture where they would learn the discipline of hard work, the value of education, and respect for their elders according to the Asian values that he had. He could have made tons of money here. He got paid oftentimes with mangoes and bananas and even monkeys back in the Philippines. He never became rich. Or I should say he never became wealthy. But he was rich. Because his children went on to be productive citizens of this world and even of this church. All of them are in the church today. And they're all productive citizens of God's kingdom. But Asians aren't unique in this regard. It's probably safe to say that in most cultures, people do not call their fathers by their first name. Because to call someone dad acknowledges the unique and special role and relationship that a father has with his family, with his children, to provide for them, to protect them, even to the point of laying down his life for them. Perhaps that is why in teaching his disciples to pray, Jesus instructed them to address God as their Father. Why? Because as their Father, his will would always be for their good. As their Father, he would provide for their daily bread. As their Father, he would deliver them from evil even to the point of laying down his life for them. The war in Ukraine has saddened us all. But we've also been amazed and inspired by the fierce resistance of the Ukrainians against overwhelming odds. Now, of course, the sophisticated weaponry and ammunition supplied by the United States and NATO have been crucial in this regard. But I'd like to suggest that there is another reason for this as well. You see, at the start of the war, the Russian army was largely comprised of conscripted young men, most of whom were probably in their early 20s or even younger, maybe in their teens. These young people didn't understand why they were in Ukraine. They didn't understand what they were fighting for. On the other hand, the Ukrainian resistance was bolstered by the addition of its fathers. Men up to the age of 60, by government decree, if you were 18 through 60, you had to stay in the country and fight. And while many of these men were past their prime, the fact that they understood that they were protecting their families and defending their country more than made up for their advanced age. And even though the Ukrainian army was outmanned and outgunned, they successfully defended their capital and continue to amaze the world with their fierce resistance against overwhelming odds. 
But the sacrifice of fathers isn't limited to extreme situations or circumstances. They also occur in the daily challenges of life. Shea Serrano had just exited the freeway near his home when his car suddenly stalled. After several unsuccessful attempts to restart his vehicle, he had it towed to his home. Well, when his car finally arrived in his driveway, Shea popped the hood and began trying to diagnose the problem. But it quickly became clear that his rudimentary knowledge of auto mechanics was woefully inadequate to solve his dilemma. And so he got on the phone and he called his dad. And Shay's dad listened pa patiently as his son described the problem that he had with his car, which of course he couldn't solve. And then his dad replied, okay, I'll come up there tomorrow after work. Now that may not seem like such a big deal to you until you understand that Shay's dad lived 215 miles away and that it took him three hours to drive to Shay's home after driving a city bus for 10 hours that same day. But that's what he did. And when he finally arrived at Shay's home, he went straight to Shay's car, popped the hood. Fifteen seconds later, he emerged from under the hood put his wrench back in his toolbox, walked past Shea to his own car. Perplexed, Shea asked, What's the problem? Did you not bring the right tools? We're done, son, he said. What was wrong? You're out of gas, son. After sharing supper with his son, Shay's dad headed home. Another three hours for a total of six hours round trip after driving a city bus for 10 hours that same day. But when he wrote about it nine years later, Shay recalled that his dad never teased or scolded him about that embarrassing moment. In fact, he never mentioned it again. The grace and sacrifice of fathers is the stuff from which legends are made. And so it comes as no surprise that in teaching us about God, Jesus chose to use the example of a loving father. Most of you know the story of the prodigal son, who demanded his inheritance early from his father, and who then left home to squander it on a lavish and licentious lifestyle in the world. Now, before you pat yourselves on the back, because thank God you've never done anything that bad, allow me to remind you that there, are, there is more than one way to get lost in the world. In the now defunct magazine, The Wittenberg Door, Mike Iaconelli, a lifelong youth pastor, describes the rural community in which he was raised. And he writes that if you were to ask a local pastor or a local cowboy how a cow gets lost, he might reply this way, and I'm quoting 
Well, the cow starts nibbling on a tuft of green grass. And when it finishes, it looks ahead to the next tuft of green grass and starts nibbling on that one. And then it nibbles on a tuft of green grass right next to a hole in the fence. And then it sees another tuft of green grass on the other side of the fence. So it nibbles on that one and then goes on to the next tuft. The next thing you know, the cow has nibbled itself into being lost. How many people have nibbled themselves into being lost in the world? It starts so imperceptively, but one seemingly innocuous turn leads to another, and then another, and another still, until one day we wake up and realize that we don't know where we are. We don't know how we got there. We don't know what to believe anymore. And it is then that we begin to realize that we've messed up. That we're lost and need to repent. But Jesus didn't tell the story of the prodigal son simply to call us to repentance. He also told it to teach us how to reconcile with our Father. And so in my study and meditation, I've discovered three ways, three keys, if you will, in Jesus' parable that may help us in this regard. And the first one is this. To reconcile with our Heavenly Father, we must admit that we cannot stay where we are. Let me say that again. To admit or to reconcile with our Heavenly Father, we must admit that we cannot stay where we are. I invite you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 15 and look at verses 17 and the first part of verse 18. Luke 15, starting in verse 17. I didn't make any slides for you this week. I didn't have time. But that's good for you. You get to, you get to look into your Bibles. So Luke 15, starting in verse 17. As he stands in the muck of a pig pen, which I can only imagine has got to be one of the most humiliating places for a proud Jewish boy to be. The prodigal son finally comes to his senses and he says, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving, I will set out and go back to my father. How often have we been confronted by the truth of our messed up lives? Only to say, it's not that bad. I don't need to change. Alcoholics say this. Pornographers say this. Philanderers say this. Drug addicts say this. Cheaters say this. Liars say this. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. And yet despite our deceptive rhetoric, we cannot deny the truth that confronts us. 
even as we stand in the muck of our messed up lives. When you realize that your father's servants are better off than you are, that's a wake-up call. And so at this lowest point in his journey, the prodigal son finally comes to his senses and he says to himself, I've got to get out of here. That, friends, is the first key in reconciling with your father. That is to admit that we cannot stay where we are. But notice that this young man doesn't just admit that he can't stay where he is, but he actually does something about it. Look at the first part of Luke 15, verse 20. It says, so he got up and went to his father. This brings us to the second key in reconciling with God, which is that we must arise and return to our father. We must arise and return to our Father. You see, friend, it's one thing to believe in the truth, but quite another to act on it. That's the difference between faith and trust. Faith is believing in something or someone. But trust is acting on that faith. That's what James means when he writes in James 2 verse 17 that faith without works is dead. Too many people today want God to save them in their sins but not from them. Friends, we cannot continue to wallow in the pig pen of sin and expect to reconcile with our Heavenly Father. If we truly want our relationship with God to be restored, We must admit that we cannot stay where we are. And we must arise and return to our Heavenly Father. That's what confession and repentance are all about. But if we do this, we have a powerful promise from Jesus who represented our Heavenly Father on earth. Turn in your Bibles again to John chapter 6, verse 37. John chapter 6, verse 37. And here Jesus says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Whoever, Jesus says, that must include me. That must include you. Whoever comes to Jesus, he will never drive away. That's the promise of our Heavenly Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. That no matter how badly we may have messed up, 
if we admit that we cannot stay where we are, and if we arise and return to our Father, He promises to receive us. He promises to accept us. He promises to forgive us with open arms. That statement comes with a profound implication, which is that we cannot earn our way home. But just because we can't earn our way home doesn't mean that there is nothing we need to do. That is why we must admit that we cannot stay where we are. That is why we must arise and return to our Father. But as important as repentance may be, it doesn't give us the right to become children of God once again. The only way that can happen is if we allow ourselves to humbly fall into the embrace of our Father's amazing grace and love by humbly accepting his welcome home. And that brings us to the third key in reconciling with God, which is that we must accept his welcome home. I want you to notice how this transformation takes place in the prodigal son. Turn to Luke 15 once again and look at verses 18 and 19. Luke 15, 18 and 19. Here the prodigal son develops a plan to reconcile with his father. He says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. Make me like one of your hired men, like one of your servants. You see, the prodigal son thinks that he can somehow earn his way back into his father's favor by offering to be his servant. He thinks that his squandered inheritance is all that his father cares about. How often have we made that same mistake? How often have we tried to reconcile with God not as a repentant, helpless child, but as a servant attempting to repay a debt to an angry master. Notice what happens in verses 20 and 21. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. 
Okay. What about the rest of the speech? Do you notice what the young man leaves out? He no longer says, make me like one of your hired men. Why? Because as the prodigal son falls into his father's loving embrace, he finally realizes that there is nothing he can do to earn his father's favor. Absolutely nothing. And so he gives up trying. And through tears of remorse and repentance and gratitude, he simply surrenders. He simply accepts his father's welcome. It's a great story. But is it true? Well, the Old Testament gives us an historical example of this very Turn in your Bibles once again to our scripture reading today. In Jeremiah 31, verses 18 through 20. Jeremiah 31, verses 18 through 20. Like the prodigal son and his older brother in Jesus' story, Ephraim was the younger of Joseph's two sons. Remember who the older one was? Manasseh. These two sons fathered two tribes that eventually replaced Joseph and Levi in the 12 tribes of Israel. You know that. But when the tribes divided into the northern and southern kingdoms. Ephraim came to symbolize the ten northern tribes, just like Judah came to symbolize the two southern tribes. So Ephraim now symbolized the ten northern tribes that rebelled against God and that were eventually conquered by Assyria and apparently lost to history. We now call these tribes the ten lost tribes of Israel because we're not quite sure what happened to them. But they weren't lost to God. Jeremiah 31. Look at verses 18 and 19. Here God hears his younger son's cry. And he says, I have surely heard Ephraim's moaning. You disciplined me like an unruly calf. And I have been disciplined. Restore me and I will return because you are the Lord my God. After I strayed, I repented. After I came to understand, I beat my breast. I was ashamed and humiliated. 
because I bore the disgrace of my youth. Doesn't that sound like the prodigal son in Jesus' story? More importantly, does that sound like you? Perhaps you've rebelled against God. Or maybe you've just nibbled away from him. But friend, I'm here to tell you that if you will admit that you cannot stay where you are, and if you will arise and return to your father, And if you will accept his welcome home, you will discover that he has never stopped loving you. Notice what he says to his young son in Jeremiah 31 verse 20. Is not Ephraim my dear son, the child in whom I delight? Often, though I often speak against him, I still remember him. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I have great compassion for him, declares the Lord. You see, friend, it's not just a story. It's true that no matter how badly you may have messed up, there is hope for you. Because you have a heavenly Father who loves you and who longs for you to come home. I want to speak to the fathers here today. Whether you're in this building or watching online. Maybe you're struggling in a relationship with your son or daughter. Maybe they've rebelled against you. Or even against God. Maybe the burden that you're carrying for them seems too great for you to bear. Well, I'm here to remind you that your son or daughter is God's child too. And on this basis, he calls you to love them again and again and again and again and again again for as long as it takes. Because as your heavenly father, that's how he loves you. Don't give up on your children. Keep loving them. Keep praying for them. Never, ever give up. And so if you're a father here today, who wants to surrender to your heavenly father, so that you can be a channel of his grace and love to your child. I invite you today to stand in consecration of your heart and your life to your heavenly Father. I invite you to admit that you cannot stay where you are. I invite you to arise and return to your heavenly Father to accept his welcome home. But I can't leave the rest of you out either. And so if there is anyone here today who cannot stay where you are, anyone here today who wants to arise and 
and to return to your heavenly Father. Anyone here today who will accept your Father's welcome home as his child, I invite you to stand as well. Let us pray. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, here we are as your children, standing in the muck of our messed up lives. We cannot stay where we are. And so we've risen up and we're coming back to you. Open your arms of love that we may accept your welcome home. We come realizing that there is nothing we can do to earn our way back into your family. But we come because of your grace and love. For you have promised never to stop loving us that nothing in all creation can ever separate us from your love. And so we come in faith and trust, for we know that you have promised to accept us home. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus' name.